Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7499 in the name of Craig Coy on Scotland's hospitality and brewing sector. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Craig Coy to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Thank Craig. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Pubs are at the heart of our communities. They bring people together to help tackle uh, loneliness and social isolation. Mm -hmm. But since COVID, they have faced unprecedented pressures. Yep. The latest figures reveal that Scotland has 4,569 pubs, which contribute 61 1,900 jobs. The sector generates £1.8 billion for the Scottish economy every year, but pubs and the jobs and the economic and social contribution that they deliver are all at risk. At risk from record energy costs, nearly half of all pubs are facing energy rises of over 250 per cent, and one in three are seeing rises of over 500 per cent. At risk from sky-high rates, at risk from increased drinks, food, broadcast subscriptions and supplier costs, and at risks from a willfully negligent SNP government, the preposterously complex deposit return scheme, absurd proposed restrictions on advertising alcohol sponsorship and uh, merchandising, and a government which now appears to have an anti-alcohol agenda. Rather than easing the pressure on pubs, this government is piling the pressure on pubs like never before, and the industry minister is at breaking point. The Scottish Licensed Trade Association says that 50% of outlets were down in trade over the festive period compared to the last normal Christmas and New Year season. Six in ten outlets are closing early or for full days in the first quarter of this year. Presiding officer, Deputy Presiding Officer, wherever uh, I have lived or worked, I have always had a good local, as much if not more so for the social contact uh, than uh, a good pint. The Tyneside Tavern, the Plough, the Market in Haddington, the Allen's Head in Dulwich, the Marquis of Granby in Westminster, or when I was living in South East Asia, the Derby in Hong Kong, the Churchill Bar in Bangkok and the Penny Black in Singapore. Closer to home, just this weekend for the Rugby, the Goblin Hall and the Tweedle in Gifford. All great pubs, places where I've made good friends and enjoyed beer and banter. The Friends on Tap report, produced for camera by Oxford University, found that people who have a local have more friends and feel more connected to their local community than those who don't. Presiding officer, this week I had the pleasure of visiting Dominic McNeil, who last year stepped in to save the tower in Intranent from permanent closure and change of use to housing. For years, Dominic had visited the pub with friends on a Wednesday night for a few pints and a few games of pool. Since taking over the pub, Dominic hasn't paid himself a wage and is still swimming against the tide of rising cost and red tape. But he is seeking to transform the pub into a family-friendly hospitality venue with a cafe. Dominic and his team want to put the tower in back in the heart of the community of Trinent. And he talked fondly of his customers, the man who brings in his wife, who suffers from dementia, for some company, a cup of tea, and to watch an episode of Pointless. The elderly couple, a customer uh, who suffered from COPD, who didn't show up for his pint as he normally would. When Steph realised that he hadn't come in, they went down and found him at his home, suffering an attack. The pub staff called an ambulance and got him the treatment he needed. Across Scotland, our pubs are so much more than places where people go for a drink or a bar meal. More than the bricks and the mortar, the taps and the table, and the, ded and the dedicated people who work within them. They are part of and at the heart of the communities they serve. But sadly, the future looks bleak for many of our licensed premises. And there are urgent interventions that the Scottish Government could take to save them. In England, pubs and hospita hospitality venues currently benefit from 50% rates relief, and this will rise to 75% in the forthcoming year. Yet, despite receiving Barnet for uh, uh, funding formula to deliver the equivalent in Scotland, the SNP isn't matching this. The Scottish Peer, uh, Beer and Pub Association has calculated that this will cost Scottish pubs £34 million this year alone. The average rates bill for pubs in Scotland has now increased from £13,206 to £13,627, a double whammy for Scotland's struggling pubs. Compare this to pubs in England, 
uh, where um, 17, well, sorry, where rateable values fell by 17% on average after significant COVID recovery discounts were built in for the whole uh, re-evaluation period. Minister, we risk losing more and more pubs across Scotland. And to help them survive, the Scottish Government must urgently consider a package of post-COVID reliefs. I recognise that the Scottish Government must rightly act on the harm caused by alcohol. But we must also recognise that well-run pubs, which monitor people's consumption, are part of the solution, not part of the problem. People drink less when they are in pubs than they do when drinking at home. The COVID lockdowns showed us that. But all too often, this SNP government funds experts and launches consultations which tell ministers what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. They do this instead of listening to an industry which already complies with strict licensing and trading laws, which adopts global best practice and invests heavily in effective self-regulation. Sadly, this government appears to ignore the effective efforts by organisations such as the Portman Group. Minister, we tackle the problem of drinking by targeting problem drinkers, not by squeezing the last drop out of a sector already struggling. We reduce the harms caused by alcohol by addressing the root societal, emotional and physical causes of abuse, not by marginalising or penalising those who enjoy social alcohol consumption. We do this by directing funding towards local alcohol services and providing frontline support for those most in need. But Minister, we do not solve the problem by removing the tenants logo from pint glasses, by outlawing grassroots community sports sponsorship or by boarding up the windows of the Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh. The government, the government should pause, or at the very least massively scale back, on its consultation on alcohol advertising. Yeah. There is today also, quite rightly, huge concern about the impact of the DRS on Scotland's pubs. The in I, I will give way. Douglas Ross. I'm grateful to... I'm grateful to Craig Hoy for giving way. We've had a lot of discussion about DRS uh, today, but these concerns have been raised time and time again. Just this week, uh, the front page of the Northern Scot uh, led with a stark warning from Nigel Tiddy of Windswept Brewing, who suggests that if this scheme progresses as planned, the cost will be the closure of many small businesses in Murray and across Scotland. Does Craig Hoy agree with me that we cannot face that cost? We have to pause this scheme. This Parliament should be doing that and the Minister should be listening to what Nigel Tiddy and many others are saying. Craig Hoy. Absolutely. I agree with Douglas Ross and I'm sure that will not be the only occasion where I say that. The inexplicably complex closed-loop system uh, involved in the DRS will impose costs, yeah. complexity and cash flow flesh, uh, pressures on pubs. The unintended consequences of crushed cans, broken bottles and the search for sec secure storage, along with collection and return problems, are all clear for everyone to see. Given that many of Scotland's pubs and hospitality venues are already leaders in waste management and don't result in littering, we have to ask why pubs are being included in this system at yeah. all. Further burdens like the DRS and an advertising and merchandising ban will push many pubs over the edge in Scotland today. Unless it rethinks its approach, this SNP government will willfully and recklessly call last orders on huge swathes of our pub and hospitality sector. It is not too late, Minister, to save hundreds of pubs and thousands of Scottish jobs, but it is alarmingly very, very near to being so. Thank you, Mr Foy. And I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Maurice Golden. Speeches of around four minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the member for bringing this debate and add my voice to those recognising and applauding the stoicism and determination of many in the hospitality sector, including pubs and small hotels and restaurants and similar venues in the borders of Midlothian, which, with COVID funding, though not all received it, adapted as the epidemic progressed and somehow managed to stay afloat. I can think of one in particular in Peebles, the central bar in the Northgate, a small freehold pub, almost like someone's living room, which had a hard time during COVID because it had not the space to provide food, so missed out on support. It had its regulars, for whom it was more than a place for a wee bevy. It was their social life. Undaunted by virtual closure, the proprietor took the time to redecorate and outside added hanging flower baskets. Visit his website and you'll see what a cheery place is after his COVID efforts. Now, thankfully, we all look forward to more normal times across spring and into summer. 
Indeed, a byproduct of COVID was the popularity of the staycation and simple pleasures like taking a walk to a local cafe or pub. I think it made us all appreciate what was on our doorstep. It also means we are supporting our local communities. Particularly in rural areas, these venues are part and parcel of the community and often play a large part in raising funds for charities. In terms of rates, there is, of course, the Small Business Bonus Scheme, with some, depending on rateable value, pay no rates and other a proportion. This policy for decades has helped small businesses. There is also the Rural Rates Relief, if your business is in a designated rural area, start-up benefits and so on. All of this distinguishes the Scottish non-domestic rates from the English system. So I do not support the call for 75%, as many small businesses already receive 100% discount. It's like comparing apples and pears. It is also the case that the Scottish Government continues to pursue the Tide Pub Scotland Act 2021, currently blocked by an interim interdict, while an appeal against judicial review, which had been won by the Scottish Government, goes through the court process. Success in resisting this appeal would redress the current imbalance which acts against tenant landlords. However, one issue which I agree will cause difficulties is the deposit return scheme, where small pubs, hotels, etc. will not charge customers a 20p levy, but will instead be required to store the empties to be collected when they will be recouped. Where will these be stored? I can think of several small businesses in my area which simply cannot store. But then there is the high cost of energy, which is devastating for Hospitality Scotland. Any hotelier, publican, restaurateur will tell you this is the biggest issue facing them. It's not in the Tory motion, so the Tory motion is like a curate's egg, only good in parts. Though I note the member made passing reference to cost of energy in his opening speech, as he did rising costs as a result of 10% inflation and indeed 17% food inflation, these are by far the biggest hits on hospitality. Again, I conclude by recognising and thanking all those small hospitality businesses in my constituency for soldiering on through COVID, often with the support of their communities. Thank you, Ms Graham. I now call Maurice Golden to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank my colleague Craig Hoy for bringing forward this debate on hospitality and brewing. It's a much-needed opportunity to focus on the problems facing the sector. What the Federation of Small Businesses described as, and I quote, an unprecedented sequence of challenges. During the pandemic, hospitality did its best to adapt, and of course, the UK government stepped in to protect a million Scottish jobs. But even so, COVID smashed through the economy like a wrecking ball. Businesses are still recovering. So being hit by a global cost of living crisis as well as an energy crisis was the last thing they needed. I've met frequently with hospitality owners and drink producers in recent months, and I've heard firsthand how hard these problems are hitting home. It's worth reminding ourselves how important hospitality is for Scotland. The sector employs 200,000 people, delivers 9 billion of value to our economy and helps attract millions of visitors each year. So the Scottish Government should be bending over backwards to help them to protect these jobs and see that economic activity grow. But they're doing the opposite, burdening them with higher taxes, smothering them in red tape and even refusing to meet with them. In England, the UK Government is providing up to 75% rates relief from next year. The Scottish Beer and Pub Association, the Federation of Small Businesses and the Scottish Tourism Alliance have all called for the Scottish Government to match that support. But the SNP and Greens have chosen not to. The Fraser, Fraser of Allender Institute said the Scottish Government's budget was taking a hard line approach to business. But it's not just their budget that's hard line on business, it's their whole attitude. Just look at the proposal to ban alcohol advertising they are consulting on. Just this week, the Scottish Tourism Alliance warned the policy was, I quote, ill-conceived, 
High risk delivers self-inflicted damage to swathes of Scotland's communities. We all want to see sensible measures to tackle alcohol abuse, but it's concerning to see a proposal on the table that has such potential to risk jobs and businesses. And jobs and businesses are also at risk from the Scottish Government Deposit Return Scheme. Every business I've spoken to wants it to succeed, but the Scottish Government's cooked up a chaotic scheme that's overly complicated, costly and downright confusing. Hospitality venues have been left struggling with storage space. They still haven't been told how glass would be collected or even if there's a solution for crushed cans. And this is a major problem because the number of collections is going to increase for hospitality venues and indeed the number of bins which they need to put out will increase. Incredibly, when hospitality have tried to raise the concerns, the Minister wouldn't see them. The damage the Scottish Government is creating is of massive importance and it adds to an anti-business agenda. They should be proud to be pro-business, proud to support job creation and proud to encourage growth. That's a recipe for success, not just for businesses, but for Scotland as a whole. Thank you, Mr Golden. I now call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Fergus Huey. Ms McNeill. Thank you. Firstly, thank you to Craig Hoy for choosing this crucial debate and for raising the awareness of the current pressures facing the hospitality and brewing sector. I think it's come along a really important time. In my view and hearing the view of others, we know that the hospitality sector is probably under more pressure than any other sector that I can think of. And it's a largely wonderful and diverse industry. I say largely wonderful because I do always raise the issue of minimum wage and the issue of skills. But largely, it's a lot to offer young people, it's a lot to offer our economy. And I want to stick up for it. I discovered some of this in virtual meetings that I held during the pandemic to do my bit to engage with the sector. With Brexit, the pandemic, and now the acute cost of living crisis, it's really a truism just to say, to highlight that many businesses have gone to the wall, and many more will, if they do not get the help that they deserve. If we don't act to support this industry in its time of need, the consequences will be dire. We've heard this from many businesses um, on uh, many other issues, even the energy issue alone, I'm sure the Minister has heard thousands of examples of energy bills going up in the region of £500 to £1,500, and that isn't even the end of the story. The City of Glasgow region that I represent is very dependent on the hospitality sector, which is one of the reasons they've taken a strong interest on it. But some government decisions are making matters worse, and they don't need to be this way. I mean, the introduction of the LEZ zone in Glasgow that the Council refuses to delay, despite the huge impact on an already beleaguered taxi trade, I've just called simply for a year's delay, because without a strong taxi trade and a strong public transport, it will hugely impact on Glasgow's hospitality sector. I see this all the time. When I go at different times of the day in Glasgow, I can see visibly that the patterns of socialising are changing, possibly because they can't get home either by public transport or by, by taxi. So it makes sense to make decisions that actually are coherent in some way. And this is what concerns me, and I want to continue on this theme. The relationship with tourism is also critical to hospitality. If people don't come to your cities, um, to visit, then that you're going to lose business as a result of that. And I've had this conversation with the Minister before. He knows my concerns about support for Glasgow Airport. It's critical at this time to get people to come in um, to the city. And like other members, Sir Morris Golden in particular, I do think the impact of the deposit return scheme is still does not seem to be fully appreciated by the government on the impact that it's going to have on every single business. Um, one small distillery producer in Lith Linlithgow said that it will cost them around £21,000 to comply. Other suppliers are saying um, they'll have no choice to put their prices up. You can see the impact on the consumer. 
Um, it seems extraordinary that the government are not listening to this, regardless of where you want to be eventually in five or ten years' time, that the costs the cost of living crisis and the other impacts on, on businesses, it seems extraordinary to me in terms of even an economic strategy, not to do more to, to listen to businesses who are really concerned about the scheme. But that's not the only issue. There's two issues I've mentioned already impacting on the business sector and hospitality. Um, as already been said by Craig Coy, the, um, the consultation on restricting alcohol advertising promotion will have an impact if we don't do this properly. And I want it to be said here, the Scottish Labour believes that action is needed to address growing alcohol-related crisis. But we need to do this in a sensible way, and the way that you're choosing to do this, at the moment, the evidence seems to be that it will hurt the same businesses, but we've already been talking about are going to be hurt by these other policies. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'm doing my bit for what it's worth, and I have to put on record again my thanks to Ivan McKee for engaging with the business sector in the small group that I put together. Some of the things we do want to discuss is how can you, the UK government and the Scottish government work together and where it's possible to do things to help this industry. So Christine Graham's talked about the rates issue. I want to talk about whether or not a reduction in VAT in a short term basis. I know that's a UK government responsibility, but we're going to have joined up thinking here. If something doesn't give in this sector, if you keep piling on these duties and responsibilities and schemes and legislative change and you don't make positive schemes to support this industry, I'm afraid it will be a disaster and I'm not going to uh, be somebody who's going to be quiet about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call Fergus Ewing to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Ewing. The Cairngorm Brewery operates uh, Brewery and the Winking Owl Pub in Aviemore and has done so for uh, decades now and is run by Sam Cl Faircliffe with 30 employees. In a recent conference call, kindly arranged by Mark Tate of the Cairngorm Business Partnership, I discussed with Sam and several um, small brewers and gin distillers the impacts of the regulations that are, are being imposed upon them. Um, let me just tell you what Sam told me about her costs in running the Cairngorm Brewery. Malt, up 50%, 540 quid to 840 quid per tonne. CO2, up 100%, at 1.400%. Electricity, 17p per kilowatt hour, up to 50p. All other ingredients up 25p. This is in the aftermath of, as members have said, having to cope with COVID and Brexit and the uncertainties caused by the Ukraine war. Um, businesses now, and Sam confirmed this to me, are facing the most stressful time in their history. Minister, I know that you don't have portfolio responsibility for deposit return, but I do think that the government is perhaps beginning, somewhat belatedly, to get the message. The deposit return scheme is the worst I've ever seen in 43 years as a lawyer, a small businessman, a backbench MSP, a minister, and now a humble backbencher serving a somewhat late in the day apprenticeship starting at 65. Um, seriously, I, I do not know, presiding officer, why the Scottish Government is persisting with this scheme. Um, I can say, and I, I think the Minister knows, I warned you, I warned them, I warned them all, privately, repeatedly, not just over the past few weeks, but the past two years. This is a disaster, and it will become a catastrophe. Let me, in the time I have available, which is saying also not very much, and I said I don't want to trespass in your goodwill, perish the thought, but I wanted to make one more point, and that is this. And it results from, and I've had, I think, seven or eight meetings with the British Glass Federation. Phil Fenton explained that the DRS, it's not a recycling scheme. It's a collection scheme. There is an existing recycling scheme with producer responsibility, which is a thing called a remelt target. And the point of that is to ensure that glass uh, a recyclate is used to form cullet, and then it goes to Arda and Owen, Illinois, in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK, and it's turned back into bottles. Without that remelt target, it would just go to Roadfill because they can pay more at auction for the recyclate. Now, there is no remelt target in this DRS, uh, and guess what? 
Guess who British Glass Federation, Phil Fenton, who I as a, a humble backbencher, albeit with a lot more time in my hands these days, guess who they haven't got to meet? Well, they haven't got to meet the minister. Uh, and that is despite my lodging written questions, asking, writing to the minister, she hasn't met the British Glass Federation that know all about it. They're desperate to help. And guess what? If the glass with no remilk target goes to road fill, what happens to the carbon savings? At the moment, they are, according to Phil, 580 kilograms per ton. Now, that saving goes down for road fill to two kilograms per ton. Now, do the mass. 580 divided by two. That's how much worse things could become. Officer, I've never encountered anything like this in politics. Governments make mistakes, that's okay. But in conclusion, this is not carelessness. This, I'm afraid to say it because I've been a loyalist for nearly 50 years for my party, my cause. This, and this is why I'm speaking out, is willful, willful recklessness. It's as though the captain of the Titanic when leaving the port of Southampton, deliberately, deliberately set sail for the iceberg. It's got to stop, and it's got to stop now. Otherwise, the economic carnage that Kate Forbes described when she visited Sam Faircliff this week is almost inevitable. Thank you, Mr Ewing, and I now call Brian Whittle. Mr Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank my colleague Craig Hoy for bringing this debate to the Chamber and allowing us to highlight the importance of this sector to communities, the country over, and the significant pressures that have been heaping upon it, uh, as already ably discussed by Craig Hoy in his opening speech. Now, we know that the local pub is an essential social meeting point for so many of our communities, and that breweries, both large and niche, have such a positive impact on our economy. Yet with the short wave of COVID still resonating, they now face a further dual pressure, dual pressures of the much maligned and seriously flawed uh, Scottish version of DRS, along with the uncertainty of the potential blanket introduction of restrictions to alcohol advertising and sponsorship. Now, if there was any doubt about the concerns the industry has on the DRS scheme as it's being chaotically introduced, I wanted to highlight an extract from a letter I got uh, today from a major brewer that they sent to Circularity Scotland along with their application. And I quote Deputy Presiding Officer, We write to confirm that although we have signed the agreement, this has been done simply to comply with our obligations under the regulations and to avoid being unable to sell our products in Scotland after the go-live date. We have grave reservations about some of the terms of the agreement. We have particular concerns around the advanced payments in light of some comments from the three prospective First Minister candidates that the scheme may well be delayed beyond the scheduled go-live date. The methodology for calculating the advanced payments is not clear and has not been shared with us, so we don't know how our potential exposure can be calculated. Now they go on to say we reserve the right, we reserve the right to withhold payment of any advanced payments in the event of a delay to the scheduled go-live date, given any such delay, is now reasonably foreseeable, and you should be acting now to use reasonable endeavours to keep the amount of advance payments as low as possible. I will give way to uh, the member I agree with the point that Christine Graham raised today, but was not answered by the Minister, that actually the whole advance payments, the requirement to pay an advance payment for a delay in a scheme, uh, which delay is completely out with the control of the company means the company directors cannot sign up to this contract because they have a fiduciary duty not, not to displenish the company of its money uh, gratuitously, to give money away. They may as well be handing a million, a one and a half million pounds a month away for free. Directors can't do that. Why is it the Scottish Government hasn't got that basic point of company law that their producers' agreements are ultra viles and prima facie unlawful? Of course, I, I, I agree with, with my colleague because, of course, this is what happens. I fear when you put a minister in charge of a policy that don't understand the basic premise of business. The Deputy Officer, we have pubs who are now only beginning to realise that stores 
of bottles and cans will become a valuable commodity and must now consider how they will ensure that they have security that is adequate to protect these stores. Furthermore, they must ensure that the cans are not crushed and the bottles are not broken. So following on from the Minister's ridiculous performance today during her ministerial statement, where she point blank refused to acknowledge that only 664 drinks producers had signed up to the scheme by the close of the application against the estimated 4,500 producers Circularity Scotland itself said would register for DRS. The Scottish Chamber of Commerce issued a statement which said, and I quote, it has been clear to the business world for some time that operating this poorly designed scheme in its current form is impossible and is adding unnecessary cost pressures on the businesses. Now, I quote these uh, uh, interventions, Deputy President Officer, because it ensures that they are not my words. These are the industry's words, so there can be no suggestion of any political bias. One has to wonder what it is that the Green SNP coalition have against business, especially a business so crucial to the Scottish economy. Deputy President Officer, members' debates are often a time where we can come together to celebrate Scottish successes. Today we witness a ministerial statement that has such potentially wide-ranging negative impacts on our pubs and brewers industry that members from all sides of the chamber are almost pleading with the minister and the Scottish Government to listen to the serious concerns of the industry. Instead, the minister doubled down on this chaotic scheme, remained deaf to MSC colleagues, the industry and even the prospective candidates for the first minister's position and blamed everyone else for the problems. Can I once again thank my colleague Craig Hoy for allowing us the time to highlight the plight of pubs and brewers. This industry is central to our community's well-being and we must protect this integral part of our economy. You can rest assured, Deputy Presiding Officer, that we on this side of the Chamber will do everything we can to highlight their concerns. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. And I now call on uh, Minister Ivan McKee to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to Craig Hoy for bringing this uh, debate before Parliament and to the many members uh, who have uh, made their contributions to highlight the importance of the hospitality and brewing sectors to Scotland and taking this opportunity to get their, their points on, on the record. Um, the sector, of course, is, uh, has been highlighted by many members, hugely important to Scotland's economy is a core part of our communities and indeed our culture, providing employment for upwards of 200,000 people, offering employment opportunities across all of society with, of course, an ever-growing, diverse workforce. There are some 130 breweries in Scotland, um, around 10 of whom in the, in the south of Scotland, producing high-quality products for both domestic and, of course, increasingly uh, international export markets. And that demonstrates Scotland's business strength and entrepreneurial spirit. And I was delighted to see some fine examples of that on my recent trip uh, on trade and investment to uh, Southeast Asia. Um, hospitality, of course, is a, uh, an incredibly resilient sector, despite the many, many challenges that, uh, that have uh, presented themselves to the sector in recent years. Um, it, it's good to see that despite the challenges, some 590 more businesses opened than closed over the, uh, the period of 2021 in the accommodation and food sector. Um, but of course that doesn't take away from the, the challenges that we absolutely recognise the sector faces and the Scottish Government is committed to supporting the sector where we can. And the heritage associated with uh, the hospitality and brewing sectors helps put our nation and regions on the map and of course promote Scotland's image to a global audience, something of course in my role as Minister responsible for trade and investment is hugely, hugely important. Um, and those sectors, it's fair to say, I think are national assets to celebrate and develop for a sustainable and successful future. As I indicated, of course, and we all know the sector has been through some, some real challenges over the uh, recent years and, and members are right to highlight uh, that conditions have been especially tough for hospitality and brewing over those, uh, those times. With COVID, where of course the Scottish Government did everything we could to support the sector through those most testing of times, all financial support made available to us was passed on in the most equitable and speedy manner possible, though we know that the support given was never going to be and never could fully compensate for the loss of business suffered. Um, and of course this was the case right across the UK and indeed internationally where the sector faced many, many challenges. Challenges now, of course, are different, although no less profound in my many interactions with businesses in the sector. I absolutely understand the, the challenges of the cost crisis, the high energy costs, wider inflationary 
pressures caused by global supply chain issues. The sector, of course, also grappling with it. labour shortages, often highlighted as the most significant constraint on the sector's ability to grow and prosper, partly caused by COVID, but of course largely created by the impact of Brexit, which has halted vital labour market access with the ending of uh, free movement and the post-Brexit immigration apparatus does not compensate for this. We have a structure that does not serve the sector needs and something we continue to press the UK Government on alongside, of course, industry representation. We are also pressing the UK Government on support with energy costs. On the 22nd of February, my ministerial colleagues John Swinney and Michael Matheson wrote jointly to Grant Sharps, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, to raise concerns over the lack of engagement in respect of the forthcoming energy bills discount scheme, seeking a meeting to discuss our concerns ahead of it coming into force at the start of April. We want to ensure vulnerable businesses, and particularly small businesses, and those on fixed price contracts are given proper protection and consideration in the new scheme of press, pressing UK Government on those issues on behalf of Scotland's business communities. Uh, oh, I'm spoilt for choice. Craig Hoy. I thank the Minister for eloquently listing the challenges that the sector faces. Will he perhaps um, approach the issue of the challenge of DRS with more candour than his colleague uh, Lorna Slater? And does he credibly and honestly believe that if the figure of 84% uh, of companies that haven't signed up is accurate, does he not concede that the system simply cannot go ahead? Minister. I'll come on to talk about my interaction with the business community around, uh, around DRS and, uh, and other um, uh, issues facing the sector in, uh, through the course of my, uh, my remarks. Um, we continue to, must continue to support the, the sector where we can on NDR. I know an issue that's been, been raised by many members today. We've taken a different approach, of course, from UK Government with the aim of ensuring fairness and optimal use of what are limited resources. And in the budget statement in December, Deputy First Minister delivered the number one ask of uh, 18 different business uh, organisations and many, many businesses in regards of uh, freezing the poundage rate for uh, next year at, uh, at the same, year, uh, same rate as this year. And that remains the lowest poundage rate in the United Kingdom for the fifth year in a row, forecast to save business rate taxpayers £308 million compared to an inflationary increase. And we're also supporting a package of reliefs worth £744 million, including the small business bonus, which uh, has been highlighted by Christine Graham and others, um, which has been reformed and extended and remains the most generous small business relief across the UK. Uh, do I have time? Uh, yes. Sure. Just a little bit of history. In fact, it was the Conservatives in negotiating a budget many years ago with Derek Brownlee that introduced the small business bonus scheme, which the Scottish Government was happy to accept. Gone are those days. Minister. Uh, thank you for that intervention. I want to um, now talk about the, uh, the work that I'm doing with businesses um, through my extensive engagement. And members will be very well aware that I talk to business organisations, particularly in the, the sector, on an almost daily basis through the, the, the Business Regulation Task Force that was set up at the end of last year. It um, has two meetings already, its third meeting coming up, with a wide representation from across many business sectors, including, of course, extensive representation from the hospitality, leisure and tourism sector. The the focus of that task force is to urgently look at the, uh, the, the, the regulations that are coming down the track, not to unpick the regulations, uh, each one uh, on its own. There's plenty of scope to do that in other, in other forums and ministerial engagement with the relevant ministers, but to look at the, the cumulative impact of those regulations, to look at the timing, to look at the process, to make sure that the business um, regulation impact assessment uh, process has teeth and is taken account of when, business, uh, when government looks at these, uh, these regulations, because it is very important that uh, that overall perspective is taken and businesses have the opportunity to be able to raise those concerns with the, with, with the Minister responsible for business and I'm delighted that that group is uh, making good progress on those, uh, those issues. Uh, indeed. indeed. Douglas Ross. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. He speaks about significant uh, engagement that he has with the business community. Can he then tell us how many producers in Scotland could have signed up for the DRS scheme by today? We know 664 have. Out of a total what? 
What is that number, given his experience and his interactions with all these businesses? Minister. Well, I haven't obviously spoken to every single business that's involved in this, um, and I don't have that number to hand, but I, I know that the, the, the member is very keen to get that number. I know some numbers are quoted earlier on, and I'm sure if he continues to ask the relevant minister, I'm sure he will get, uh, get the appropriate answer. Um, I want to talk also about, as was mentioned by Christine Graham, our, our commitment to the implementation of the Tide Pubs Act as soon as possible. And unfortunately, we're in a position there where uh, that is subject to judicial review, but our commitment to taking that, uh, that work forward to give uh, rights to, uh, to uh, tenants uh, uh, is, uh, re remains in, in place. Um, and of course, there's other work happening to support the, uh, uh, the sector through uh, the reform of permitted development rights to allow premises to make better use of space and to improve their business models and increase revenue, which I think is something we're all, all keen to keen to see. Um, so we are we're very keen to take forward all of that work. So in conclusion, we are very uh, focused on a, a strong and successful and vibrant hospitality and brewing sector in Scotland. A key part of our national strategy for economic transformation was about providing support for, for entrepreneurial businesses to make businesses more productive across all the regions of Scotland and to deliver the skills uh, necessary to support those business growth. We want to see hospitality space has been well used and responsibly with viable businesses, of course, contributing to local economies and communities. And of course, we want to see fair work at the heart of the sector, something I press very strongly with, uh, with, with businesses in the sector, um, something I raised with my meeting just, uh, just this week with uh, trade unions representing uh, members in the sector. It's something Paul McNeill has rightly uh, raised in this debate uh, this afternoon. Um, so I, I think it's uh, uh, important also to recognise the work that we're taking forward. The Industry Leadership Group for Tourism and Hospitality, which I uh, co-chair with Mark Croth of the Scottish Tourism Alliance and also as trade union representation on it, where we have the opportunity to give strategic oversight to the medium and long term challenges facing the sector. And of course, Paul McNeill also right to identify the importance of tourism, uh, those international links, uh, which, which you can rest assured we're working hard to restore and increase the number of air links into Scotland to uh, ensure that tourists uh, come in ever increasing numbers to our, our shores. Um, so in conclusion, um, we have a commitment on, on my part to continue to engage with the sector, to listen to what the sector has to say on, on regulation and other challenges facing it, and as a government, a pro-business government, to take the steps that uh, we need to, to, uh, to take that forward. I'll be meeting again with trade bodies in the sector on the 15th of March here in Parliament, and uh, we'll be planning to attend the, the Scottish Parliamentary Hospitality Group by, of course, Polly McNeill um, uh, later, later in March. And I look forward to both. Uh, and I once again thank Craig Hoy for bringing this uh, debate forward to Parliament this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. And I close this meeting.